You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome to the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. A few reminders before we get started with this week's show, who features a doctor. Yes, there is a doctor in the house coming up on this week's show. Stay tuned. But remind you guys to please continue to leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. If that's how you get your podcasts, please go there, leave us a rating and a review. We've actually seen an uptick. You guys have been listening to me. You've actually been following through, so we certainly appreciate it. Let's crack into that top 100 Apple Podcasts. We're getting a lot, lot closer, and we're doing it with your help. So please leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Also, want to remind you about our promotion with Amazon with the holidays coming up. This is so, so important because you can do your holiday shopping and help out veterans all across America by doing one simple thing, going to our website, hazardground.com, and clicking on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the Sponsors tab. It'll redirect you right to Amazon. You can do all your normal Amazon shopping. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend, and then we'll donate a percentage of that back to veterans charities that have been featured here on the Hazard Ground. So, again, easy way for you to help out veterans and do your holiday shopping all at the same time. Hazardground.com. Click on that Amazon button. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. We are growing, 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 and we're doing it with your help. So, again, spread the word around. Show us some love. And make sure you tell a friend to listen to The Hazard Ground. Hope everybody is having a wonderful, happy, safe, and healthy holiday season so far. And now let's get on to this week's episode. Joining us this week on the podcast is a retired Army doctor who is also a lieutenant colonel. He went to West Point and spent time in the historic 75th Ranger Regiment. He also worked in the Special Operations community with multiple deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan. And he went on to help shape U.S. Army medicine as an instructor for the U.S. Army, and currently is an ER doctor in Dallas. He is Dr. Jeffrey Kane joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Jeff, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for having me, Mark. I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Uh, very long career. Uh, you have done a lot, to say the least, um, you know, and your career started uh, in, in the in the mid-80s at West Point, um, but, you know, it takes you all the way through the war on terror, and obviously you got to do some very interesting things with the Ranger Regiment. So uh, I want to get to all of it, but uh, how did you end up at West Point and why? Huh. Well, actually, I ended up at West Point uh, courtesy of the United States Air Force, if you let be honest with you. Um, growing up on a farm, you know, my grandparents, you know, they were born around the World War I time frame and saw the advent of the airplane. And that was something that always fascinated my grandfather. Whenever an airplane would fly over, he'd make it a point to show it to me and point that out. And, uh, I always wanted to grow, you know, I always wanted to be an astronaut, of course, at that time. You know, you're talking about somebody who was born in 65. Um, the moon landings occurred and everything, and the Apollo programs were being televised. And I saw something when I was in high school, this this airplane called the SR-71. And this was just an amazing plane. That's what I wanted to do. So I geared everything up to going into the Air Force, uh, joined the Civil Air Patrol, uh, found out that I liked the ground aspect of doing search and rescue in the Civil Air Patrol more than the flying around part, um, but was uh, afforded an opportunity to go to the Air Force uh, and got a four-year federal scholarship to do that. Um, but when I took my commissioning physical, my eyesight wasn't good enough to qualify me for flight. <laughs> and so I said, well, what else is there for a guy like me to do in the Air Force? And at the time, my options were pretty limited. I could sit in a missile silo somewhere out in the West, which really didn't interest me very much. Um, or I could be a civil engineer and build roads and runways on uh, the air bases. And that really didn't interest me too much. And so when I asked and inquired several times about special operations, everybody just gave me that blank stare and like, dude, this is the Air Force. That's not what we do. If you <laughs> want to do that, you kind of need to go to the Army. Um, and so I, I regrouped and had an opportunity to interview for uh, an appointment to West Point. Uh, I secured that and was afforded an opportunity to go to West Point. And so I started that in 1984. Uh, that was my pathway into the Army, thinking that for no other reason, since I really didn't have anybody in the family to guide me in military uh, direction, and I came from a small farming community where, you know, 
folks that graduated from high school either enlisted in the Army or the Marine Corps, and they did their you know initial en uh, enlistment and came back, I really didn't know that much about the military. So I was just firmly convinced that if I was able to get into West Point, if I graduated from West Point, they'd have to let me go straight into Special Forces. And that was the whole thought process that got me into West Point, and <laughs> the rest, I guess, is history. It's interesting because I, I, I bring this up a lot that – you know, when you were going through this in, in the mid 80s, like special forces wasn't a thing like it is now. They didn't make movies about it. They didn't write many books about it. You know, they didn't tell all these glorious tales about it, what it's like to be a Green Beret. You know, I mean, I'm sure, you know, you had the John Wayne movie back in the day. But other than that, you weren't really referencing much, uh, you know, as far as special operations. So why were you so in tune with it, do you think? Um, well, uh, John Wayne's movie had a lot to do with it. Uh, we watched that uh, on, uh, uh, you know, almost a continuous loop on, you know, the VCR at the time. Um, and I thought, man, these guys, if this is what it, if this is what special forces is all about, this is what I wanted. This is how much more cool could it be for a farm kid, you know, growing up stomping around the woods. And it, this is, this is really a way to serve my country and get me off the farm and do something, you know, really productive. Um, I'd read a lot about special forces in Vietnam. Um, we didn't really know anyone uh, who had either been in special operations, uh, the precursor to special forces, really didn't have any close connection to anybody with military service, except for my other grandfather, who had been an aircraft mechanic in World War II. And so there wasn't a lot known about it. And the mystique, I think, is just what gravitated me towards, I want to do this. This is what I want to do. Again, I, I, I am sort of taken aback by that, but uh, just, you know, <laughs> the, the sheer knowledge of it. But the other thing I'm wondering, your experience at West Point, uh, everybody who has gone there, uh, good, bad, or indifferent, has looked back on it fondly. I assume that, you know, your time at West Point is still uh, one of the major highlights of your military career. Well, you know, Mark, I, I think it was a highlight of my career as far as, you know, meeting the people uh, that I went to school with. Uh, absolutely phenomenal group of Americans. Uh, some of us have remained very close, you know, um, through our time since we first met there. Um, just, just phenomenal relationships that you build with people. Um, as far as the institution itself goes, honestly... Again, I didn't know what to expect. Just the history of the institution, you know, some of its very celebrated graduates. Um, and it was, you know, vaunted at the time as this is the premier leadership school for the United States military. So if you want to learn how to lead soldiers in combat, this is where you go. And I will tell you, I was grossly disappointed in my experience uh, with that particular aspect of the institution at the time. Um, you know, it was the mid 80s. Uh, the majority of our strategic leadership in the military had grown up in a conscript army, not the all volunteer force that we had. Yeah. And so as the junior officers who were now part of this volunteer force were coming up, we weren't really exposed to those people. Uh, we had very little interaction um, with active duty people. I had no interaction with enlisted personnel except for during uh, summer training. Um, and that was very limited. Uh, and so the leadership style and the leadership principles that were being presented at the time probably worked well for those people from a conscript army who were forced to, you know, take all comers and mold them quickly and coherently into a fighting force. Not necessarily the same principles that would be uh, productive and beneficial for taking people who already raised their hands and say, hey, I want to be here and creating an effective, cohesive fighting force and a strong team with that. All right. So you graduate from West Point uh, and you are headed to uh, infantry school and, and everything else. I mean, kind of take me through the next couple of years. Yes, sir. So at the time, you know, uh, West Point, you get to select your branch. Uh, I was high enough in the class. I wouldn't say I was a stellar cadet, uh, but I did well enough in academics that uh, I was able to select my branch and I selected infantry. Um, the only post that really wasn't available to me at the time was Vicenza, Italy, uh, because there were only three slots. And guess who took that? You know, first, second, third guys in the order of merit. Not me. Um, and so I was able to uh, I was able to take a posting in Berlin, um, which at the time was still an occupied city. Uh, you know, the 
uh, you Germany still had, was yeah, still two Germanys divided. back then, yeah. Yeah, still a divided country. Um, and so during the height of the Cold War, when you're facing down, you know, the, the communist horde, what better place to be than smack dab in the middle, you know, several hundred kilometers behind enemy lines? Um, and I had to figure, you know, gosh, there's probably nobody that's poised more, you know, uh, other than some of the rapid deployment forces. There's nobody poised right now to actually start mixing it up with these guys. This is where I need to be. And again, probably not a well-reasoned or very mature thought process, but that's what got me there. And so I went to Berlin, Germany. After getting there, did you feel like this is what you signed up to do? Um, did you feel like you were you were in the the special operations world? I know you weren't didn't go through the Green Beret portion of things, but did you feel like this is where you were supposed to be? Um, yes and no. You know, up until that time, you know, I knew some guys. I had gone through the infantry basic course uh, with a couple of guys who had been prior enlisted in uh, uh, in the Ranger battalions. Um, and so I got to know a little bit about the construct of the Ranger Regiment um, and a couple of guys that had gone through OCS and who were uh, Reserve Special Forces guys. And they just didn't talk very much about what they were doing. So there was still this big mystique about what was going on. But I had a pretty good understanding of what a nominative assignment was and you know the personnel that were assigned to that. Um, when I actually arrived at Berlin, I was a little bit surprised that that wasn't exactly the picture that we found on the ground. Um, you know, uh, it was, uh, you know, a regular army unit, uh, the, you know, regular army soldiers, they had volunteered to be there. Um, but not all of them had volunteered. A lot of them had been just sent there on assignment. And so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that ultra elite, you know, four time volunteer force, uh, that you're stepping into. You're stepping into a cross segment of a conventional army that, oh, by the way, in the late 80s was not set up on the same organization tables as the rest of the conventional army. It was, it still had its own unique makeup uh, of how it operated. Um, so there was a, a little bit of differences to get adjusted to. You know, you missed Desert Storm while you were in Germany. Did you feel like, oh, damn, there was my shot, and I'm, I'm sitting here staring at a wall? Of course I did. You know, all of us lieutenants at the time were digging into uh, uh, Colonel Hackler's book. Uh, that was kind of our, our, our go-to manual for how, how are we supposed to do things as a, as a warrior. Uh, and, you know, in his book he talks about, you know, volunteering and, and going to these different places and going to these different units and, you know, being audacious enough to just walk in and say, hey, I'm here in this theater. You guys are fighting. I want to be with your unit. And through luck of the draw, uh, you know, for whatever circumstances was afforded that opportunity. And sitting there in Berlin, while all of Desert Shield and then Desert Storm kicked off, there was an opportunity for some of us uh, to go and participate. That opportunity turned out to be platoon leaders for transportation units. So you're essentially in charge of a bunch of truck drivers. Um, and everybody has a job to do, but that's not exactly frontline, you know, punching people in the face. Um, for those that went, they were not able to parlay themselves into infantry units like they thought they would. They got assigned to their uh, various transportation units. They stayed with their various transportation units. They got kind of stuck there for probably about six or seven months and then came back having had experience in combat as transportation leaders. All right. So next, uh, you get out of Germany and you're headed where? So at the time, um, it was an interesting time to be there. I got uh, to Berlin uh, probably two weeks after uh, the former East Germans had shot the last guy that they shot trying to get across the wall. And literally within a year's time frame, the wall was coming down. So as the wall came down and they started the drawdown, um, we started the closing down units in Berlin. My infantry battalion was the first one that was selected to be uh, inactivated. With our home unit uh, or our parent unit being back at Fort Campbell, Kentucky, uh, we decided to do that historical inactivation ceremony back in Fort Campbell. So I was on general orders to return back to the United States, uh, uh, back to Fort Benning to fill the needs of the Army because nobody really knew what that was at that mm -hmm. time. Um, 
And all I knew is that I was on a general order to return to Fort Benning and await the infantry officer base, uh, infantry officer advance course. Uh, so I had another two years of lieutenant time to do before I could go to the advance course. And so I'm scratching my head thinking, what am I going to do? Um, I had put in a packet uh, to go to the Ranger Regiment, as probably every infantry lieutenant on the planet does. Uh, and that packet, is, you know, it kind of stayed on a, on a shelf somewhere because I was part of Europe. And at the time, people were not coming back from Europe. So I took it on myself to drive. I, I took some extra leave, jumped in a car. I drove down to Fort Benning. Uh, and probably one of the boldest moves that I can think of a lieutenant doing, stomped into uh, Ranger Regimental Headquarters, knocked on the S1's door and said, hey, Lieutenant Kane, you've got my packet. I'm here. I know you need lieutenants. Where can I serve? And, you know, without missing a beat, he just kind of looked at me and gave me that look that, you know, now I understand why I got that look. Thinking, what is this guy doing in my office? Um, said, you know, Lieutenant, that's pretty bold. You know, I, I appreciate the offer, but, you know, I don't need you. Get the hell out of here. Uh, go report to post. I said, well, you know, there's got to be there's got to be an opportunity for Lieutenant. You always need an extra Lieutenant. I know you do. I, I've heard stories from guys that have been in Ranger Regiment before. I know there's always an opportunity for a motivated Lieutenant. I'm here. I'm not going anywhere. You know, please, sir, you got to find me a job. And uh, he said, look, I'm telling you, I'm the regimental adjutant. I don't have anything for you. And I really don't appreciate this intrusion into my time. But I'll tell you what, Lieutenant, go down the street to 3rd Ranger Battalion. You knock on the S1's door. If he hires you, we'll take you. So I ran down the street to adjutant for first third ranger battalion knocked on his door and after some discussion he said you know i've got these two lieutenants who are classmates of mine who are in the 82nd who were supposed to be here like three months ago but they're stuck over with the desert shield desert storm thing um we're not sure when they're coming back so until they can get here i'm short a couple lieutenants i'll take you and that's how i got to the ranger regiment as an infantry lieutenant yeah uh that's not usually how it goes <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> well, listen, what do they say? You know, uh, nothing ventured, nothing gained. No guts, no glory. You know, the worst they could tell you is no. And uh, you took advantage of all that and ended up in a, in a place you never thought you'd be. At least it's someplace you wanted to be, right? Exactly. Um, and that's where I got my graduate level education in leadership, honestly. Uh, what a revelation. Um, and again, it's a different Ranger Regiment in the late 80s, early 90s than it is today. Um, but at the time, uh, just what a dynamic, what a dynamic place with some dynamic individuals, uh, had a chance to learn from just some of the absolute, absolute best leaders that our country has ever produced. Um, and I wouldn't trade that, you know, wouldn't trade that for anything. Had an opportunity to do uh, platoon leader time, uh, was a company executive officer for, uh, about, uh, eight months. And then I got promoted to captain earlier than we had anticipated. And at the time, in the Ranger Battalions, there was kind of the rule of there can be only one. So at the company level, there could be only one company, uh, only one captain, and that was the company commander. So as a young captain, I was immediately <laughs> taken out of the company XO position and said, hey, we need to find you a job. Um, but you're, you're not in sync yet to go to the advanced course. What do you want to do? How can, you know, where, where can we place you? And we had a few things happen uh, around that time frame as well. So in October of 1992, uh, we had an operation where my battalion commander uh, was riding as an uh, uh, observer for an exercise that 1st Ranger Battalion was conducting. Um, they were riding at night over the Great Salt Lake in a helicopter, and one thing, one thing led to another, and that helicopter went in. Uh, killed almost everybody on the aircraft, um, and so we had a really bad, a really bad episode uh, during training. Um, and I talked to some people about what my options were going to be, thinking I was going to go to uh, the selection course, um, and then hopefully take the long walk and assess into another unit. Uh, at the same time that that happened, uh, one of my best friends was getting ready to leave to go to medical school. So I sat down and talked with him. I said, hey, how, how did you, you know, how did you become interested in this? Uh, and he kind of laid out the pathway for what he was doing uh, and come to find out uh, several of the lieutenants from his year group were doing the same thing. Everybody was headed to medical school to start their next part of their career as physicians. I'd never, ever considered that. Never thought I was smart enough to go to medical school. I thought, wow, I, I think I could probably do that, you know? I think that being a physician may be a little bit better than walking through swamps and, you know, 
jumping out of planes for the rest of my life. Um, maybe that's an option for me. And so I, I, I sat down at the time uh, with uh, our regimental commander was Colonel Grange. Uh, the SOCOM commander was General Downing uh, and had an opportunity to have an office call with them uh, and told them what my, you know, essentially what my choices were. And they just looked at me, both of them said, hey, you know, here's the deal. We have an endless pipeline, literally an endless pipeline of guys coming to selection and guys going to take the long walk. We can choose whoever we want at any time because that pipeline never dries up. What we don't have and what you understand as being part of this unit now are physicians and doctors that really understand what we do and how we operate. So if you really think you can get into medical school, we'll support that and we'll help you down that pathway. Seemed like a pretty easy decision to make. I did it. I got letters of recommendation. The next thing you know, I'm headed to medical school. Wow. Uh, you skipped over uh, just uh, two other notes that I have here. Um, one, you actually um, were in the Ranger Regiment um, with uh, some guy named Richard Clark. Yeah, he's, uh, he's kind of important, right? Uh, for those who don't know, General Richard Clark, four-star general, is now the SOCOM commander. So uh, <laughs> that's a pretty interesting sort of uh, connection. Yes, General Clark. Yeah, what what a fantastic American! Um, of course, I knew him when he was rich, right? And we were captains <laughs> together. And in fact, his younger brother was my classmate, and that's how we actually got introduced the first time. Oh wow! Um, at, at West Point. Um, but in any case, uh, uh, General Clark was then on the regimental staff. I, I think he was waiting. Uh, he was waiting in line to take the – at the time, the Regimental Reconnaissance Detachment was an, uh, an independent uh, company command, and I think he was in line to take that. Uh, and so he was working as either the Assistant S4 or the Assistant S3, um, and I was a special liaison officer uh, specifically for overseeing the uh, units that um, – supported the Ranger Regiment uh, in their outload and deployment capabilities at, at Fort Benning. Um, and we got alerted one night that uh, we needed to get things going because we were outloading a, a, a part of the unit to go to Fort Bragg, link up with the unit, and go to Somalia. And so uh, that, was, that was our contribution to the effort for Task Force Ranger was getting everybody Back to Fort Benning, getting all the ammunition uh, loaded up on the planes, making all that stuff happen essentially in the middle of the night. Um, interesting time. Yeah. Uh, so now this is the second time that you have been passed over for a chance to go into combat. Uh, you're upset at this? Um, frustrated, of course. Uh, I think any any warrior who doesn't get asked to go participate in a, in a, in a nation's fight um, – uh, has some issues with that. And selfishly, I really believe that I had something to contribute. And the reason why I believe that was because at the time, I was not only the liaison officer specifically for the Ranger Regiment, but I had oversight for everything that was being done uh, on and through Fort Benning. Uh, and one of the units that we had outloaded through Fort Benning and, and deployed was a heavy engineer unit. And so these guys, and, and I knew some of these guys, I actually worked with some of these guys in my capacity as a, as a liaison officer, um, these guys were sitting in their compound on the, the, the day and the night of the October 3rd battle uh, in downtown Mogadishu and, you know, unable to talk to the task force, you know, two American units operating completely separate and distinct from each other, um, you know, the task force ranger having no idea what these guys had in their compound literally, you know, blocks away with armored bulldozers that may have been able to push through some of the roadblocks that they had encountered. You know, looking back, you can always say, you know, looking back through a retrospective scope, hindsight's always 2020 and coulda, woulda, shoulda. Um, but we had a very specific personnel cap and I was not going to be a trigger puller and we needed to, uh, you know, we needed to optimize the number of trigger pullers that were on the, uh, on the ground. And so it was the right decision to make. Well, nonetheless, you're headed to medical school. Um, so, uh, once again, getting yourself into something that you don't really know anything about, correct? <laughs> Absolutely correct. So on August on August 10th, I'm a, I'm a fairly junior captain in the Ranger Regiment with all the, you know, all the bells and whistles. And on August 11th, I am a second lieutenant in the Army Reserve Medical Service Corps, going to be a medical student. Kind of a, kind of a shock to the system. Yeah. Uh, where'd you end up going to medical school? 
So I actually was fortunate enough to be selected to go to the Uniformed Services University, which is okay. the Department of Defense Medical School out of Bethesda, Maryland. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and and uh, forgive the ignorance, I just don't know. I mean, is that any different than Harvard's medical school or as far as the standards or anything else, like, you know, whatever medical school you go to? Well, the standards are the same. Um, across the across the nation, there's a standardized curriculum uh, that is pretty much taught at all medical schools, uh, as well as clinical rotations when you actually go through and, and do a rotation as a medical student to, you know, get familiar with the different types of specialties. That's all standardized. But I would tell you that our nation's uh, medical school uses um, the equivalent of the service academies for undergraduate. It is probably the best kept secret in the nation um, because you don't just learn medicine. You know, I mean, you don't just learn a specific way to do medicine. You learn medicine and you get to learn from a variety of people that come from a variety of all these other programs. So if you go to Johns Hopkins, you kind of learn the Johns Hopkins way of doing medicine. If you go to Baylor, you kind of learn the Baylor tilt of doing medicine. At Uniform Services, you learn medicine and you get to rotate through any number of teaching facilities, um, whatever you can think of, you can do it. And what an experience, what an amazing experience. Um, what an amazing education. We were taught things as part of our military unique curriculum that the average civilian, uh, medical school doesn't, doesn't teach, right. All of the, the epidemiology behind tropical diseases and the importance of preventative medicine in force health protection for military forces. Those aren't really popular topics in civilian medicine because they're not needed in civilian medicine. No. Yeah. I mean, it's a, uh, I would tend to think the amount of realism in the training is probably more, I don't want to say hands on, but I, I just, I, I think that there is a certain level of, of, you know, realism that you provide that isn't necessarily OJT like you would get in the civilian side. Does that make sense? Um, yes. Yes, it does. And especially when you get to rotate through uh, the different active duty facilities, um, whether it's the hospital at uh, Fort Bragg, uh, whether it's a medical center like uh, Madigan or Walter Reed, you know, your clientele are still the same. They're either, um, you know, uh, active duty guys uh, and gals or retired active duty guys and gals. And you get to take care of these fine Americans and you get to hear some pretty amazing stories. Uh, a lot of, a lot of good, you know, a lot of good lessons learned that if you listen can really shape the way that you can approach, um, medicine in general. End up graduating from medical school, uh, and you are headed where? So after medical school, I was fortunate enough again to get selected for the emergency medicine program that I had wanted. Uh, at the time there were three army programs. Uh, one was in San Antonio, um, at Brook Army Medical Center. One was in Washington uh, at um, uh, Madigan. And then the third was at Fort Hood, Texas. And at the time, the Fort Hood, Texas program was three years straight through. The other programs were one year of a transitional internship. So you spend one year in an, in an internship, half the time in medicine topics, half the time in surgery. And then you would apply to go to the emergency medicine residency. And, and at the time, because of the popularity, many of the people who applied were asked to go be um, unit physicians uh, and take operational medicine tours, uh, which I'll tell you, that's a, an absolutely, it was a horrible idea. It was a good way to, to, fill those, uh, to fill those force structures, but it was an absolute horrible idea. And we'll talk about that later. Um, but Fort Hood was a way to go right straight through. And I knew that with my agreement with General Downing, who said, hey, we'll support you if you'll come back and take care of us. The fastest way for me to get back to the community was to do a three-year and out program. And fortunately, at the time, that was the only residency program at Fort Hood. And while we, while I was there in those three years, they started a family medicine program, but we were the only residents there. So we were the only ones that anybody had anything to do with teaching. And so it was awesome because we had all kinds of people wanting to teach us stuff because we were the only students. Wow. Interesting. Uh, two ships passing in the night. You and I were at Fort Hood at the same time. <laughs> so, small world. Um, 
Yeah, and, and Colleen, Texas kind of sucks. Uh, but that's a different discussion for a different day. <laughs> Neither here nor there. Uh, you know, they're all opportunities, Mark, right? That's yeah. All how you, all how you make, <laughs> make things happen with opportunities. And, you know, there wasn't a lot of – there wasn't a lot of opportunity there in Colleen at the time, but you know, Austin wasn't too far of a ride down the road. No, it wasn't. Um, <laughs> to, to many safety briefings on Fridays about staying off a certain road and going down to Austin. Yeah, you, you've all been yes. there before. So anyway, um, it's if so it ends up being what seven years from the time you leave the regiment until you get back. Yes, exactly. Wow. Um, Did and- they forget about you? <laughs> Well, pretty much. I mean, I'm, I'm one cog in a giant wheel and I wouldn't say that, you know, I certainly wasn't an outstanding ranger. I'll never be in a ranger hall of fame, right? You're not talking about a, a McChrystal or, or a Grange or somebody like that. You're talking about Jeff Kane. And, um, it just so happened though, uh, when it was time as my residency was coming to an end, of course, you have to balance the needs of the army with personal wants. And as my residency is coming to an end, we're being uh, told, Hey, we want you guys. Now you young doctors are all going to go out and join the army, but you're going to go to these different locations. Um, I said, Hey, I want to go back and do operational medicine. And of course I was counseled by many people in the army medical department that that was a horrible idea. Why would you waste all the time and money that we've put into you to go be an operational medicine guy when you should be doing emergency medicine in a hospital? Thought, well, that's because that's the, the agreement that I made and that's what I want to do. Um, so is there any reason why I can't go back into operational medicine? And after multiples of weeks of discussion, they finally acquiesced because they realized I was not giving up on this track. So as soon as I got permission to go back to operational, I called uh, back down to the Ranger Regiment and spoke with the regimental surgeon. And he said, Jeff, man, I've got your packet here. I just got it. I'd love to have you here, but I don't have any openings for you this year. We just filled the one position that we had at 1st Battalion. I've got a guy slated to come, so I don't have a position for you. I'm like, oh, man, okay. Well, thanks. So hung up the phone with him, called back up to uh, uh, USASOC headquarters, Special Operations Command headquarters, spoke with their uh, medical team up there and said, yeah, we've got plenty of opening, openings in uh, uh, Special Forces groups. In fact, we've got one in 7th group, and you can have that opening if you want it. Hey, I'm going back to the, you know, I'm going back to the community. Absolutely. I'll take it. So going into, I guess, going into, uh, Christmas break, I was ready to go after graduation in July, ready to sign out, sign into Fort Bragg and start my end processing. And then Christmas break uh, of what year? This would have been, uh, this was Christmas of 2000. So okay. going into new years of 2001. Um, and so literally the day that I'm getting ready to sign out on, on Christmas leave and go home, see my family, uh, I get a phone call. It's the regimental surgeon. He says, Hey, Jeff, you want first range battalion? <laughs> Absolutely. I want first range battalion. There's no place that a ranger would want to be other than first ranger battalion. Absolutely straight. I want it, but I thought you told me it wasn't available. Well, it is available now. The guy that was coming here decided he did not want to do the Ranger Regiment. He would rather be the Special Forces guy. And so now I have uh, I have a hole. You're my first guy. If you want it, the job's yours. I said, all right, I'll take it. What do I need to do? He said, well, the battalion commander will call and do a formal interview with you uh, sometime next month. We'll get that all set up. I was going to uh, a back-to-back uh, surgical intensive care unit rotation where I was going to be spending, you know, 48 to 72 hours in a hospital, get 12 hours off and go right back into that kind of three-day on, one-half-day off cycle. I'm thinking, mm, okay, well, I'm going to get a little bit deconditioned, but uh, that's okay. I won't be doing any road marching or prepping for this stuff. So I, I do my interview uh, with another just phenomenal American. Uh, I'm telling you, Mark, all the stars and planets lined up for me uh, in my career. So I get interviewed by my battalion commander, who is none other than uh, retired general Tony Thomas. Huh. And uh, he talks to me for, you know, he talks to me on the phone for a little bit and says, you know, um, I, I've, ha- I've had a couple of, I've had a couple of docs now that don't have your requisite experience. You know everything that you need to know about being in the Ranger Regiment. Uh, we want you here. How soon can you get here? That's soon, sir. How soon do you need me? He said, "We don't have a physician right now. The soonest you can get here will be uh, optimal for us." So I think graduation was all finalized by one July, um, probably six, seven July. I'm signing in the First Ranger Battalion. 
I mean, uh, first of all, you, you again cross paths with another former SOCOM commander uh, in Tony Thomas, which, you know, you, you, that's, that's two in your career. Not many people come across mm-hmm. one. You've been with two. But let me go back and ask you, because you were set to go to SF, and you chose the regiment, uh, the Ranger Regiment over, and the other kid, the other guy sort of flipped it. Why mm-hmm. Didn't you think you'd be closer to that, that operational medicine with the SF than the Rangers? Like, what was sort of going into that decision? Was it just because you made a promise to the Rangers and you wanted to keep it? Well, no, I made a promise to General Down and I'd come back to the community. Um, but I knew more, uh, honestly, I knew more about the Rangers uh, still at this time in my career than I did about SF. And I had plenty of friends who have been in SF, but I also knew their operational structure. And, you know, going in as a unit physician in SF, remember, this is still, this is still pre-9-11, um, SF's doing some great things uh, throughout the world. Uh, things that, you know, understandably, nobody will ever know. About the only time you ever know about something is when the National Command Authority either wants you to know about it or when something really bad happens. Uh, if those two things are not, uh, if, if what you're doing does not fall into one of those two things, the general public will never know what these guys and gals do. But they do it in very small units. And I realized very quickly that, you know, I would be relegated more to a role of a, a staff officer. Um, I'd get the great privilege of, of training and taking care of those uh, 18 Delta Special Forces medics uh, and some great PAs, physician's assistants. But actually being in the field was probably not going to happen. But having come from the Ranger Regiment and understanding how how that force structure was quite a bit different and, and knowing that I had, you know, the background as an infantry guy with them, I knew if we were going to go somewhere in the field, there was a better than average chance that I was going to actually have the privilege of being with my guys. Cause at the time, remember this was an all male unit at the time. So I would have the privilege of being with the guys as far forward as they would let me go. Where were you on nine 11? <laughs> 9-11, I was, when the first plane hit the tower, I was walking from a very busy day of doing ranger school and halo physicals to the chow hall to grab a cup of coffee and get ready to start my, uh, the rest of my day. Uh, walked into the chow hall and I said, hey, sir, you see this? Like, what happened? I said, this plane just flew into the, into the World Trade Center. You know, and we just, you know, kind of being a smart ass ranger, just looking at each other and going, just how much of a dumbass do you have to be to hit a freaking building with an airplane? I mean, what is this guy drunk? And we're sitting there just kind of, you know, looking at this and watching the live feed when the second plane hit the tower. And we're like, that wasn't an accident. Let's go pack and grab my senior, grab my senior medic. And we went back and started going through all the contingency supplies and said, hey, we're going somewhere. We don't know when or where because at the time, we were sitting uh, as the Ranger Regiment uh, Ready Force One. Um, the Ready Force One is that Ranger regi- uh, that Ranger unit that is ready to be deployed worldwide within an 18-hour sequence. We can compress that to nine hours if we have advanced planning. So we knew we were going to be the tip of the spear. Just knew it. It's not the way it planned out, but that's what we knew. So we went to prepare. When you say prepare, meaning what? Um. Looking at potential, you know, potential force mission structure. If we have to take the whole battalion, you know, what do we need as far as medical supply? How do we reconfigure some of these supply bundles? Um, do we have all of the equipment that we need? Uh, let's start ordering some additional things that we know we'll, we'll need a plus up on uh, because who knows once we deploy, who knows when we'll ever get a resupply bundle. Um, start making up some plans now to turn over to the logistics guys to say, hey, this is what this is how we want things configured uh, as we go in. If you ever kick out an ammo bundle or you ever kick out a chow bundle, I need this particular type of a bundle with medical supplies just thrown in there as well. Um, those are the kinds of contingency things that we just we just started nugging through and making sure our stuff was ready to go. So, how quickly do you get out the door? Not quite that quickly, Mark. <laughs> so, I, I think calmer heads prevailed, um, and. Everybody knew that there was going to be a response. Um, there was a uh, uh, there was a response team that took the initial entry missions uh, into Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, there was another uh, special number task force that was created to go do some very specific hunting in, in uh, Afghanistan. Um, we were sitting as the Ranger Ready Force One element and not really certain 
you know, what else was on the periphery from our adversaries? Uh, we just been, you know, we just been punched in the face a couple of times, uh, and, and not sure what else was in the pipeline. So the, uh, the national command authority decided that what they would do was not take the Ranger ready force one element off of our, our stand up uh, footing. They would take the unit that was next in the pipeline. And that's how third Ranger battalion uh, got into the pipeline to take the initial entry missions into Afghanistan. So third Ranger battalion deploys uh, to Afghanistan. We do some, uh, we do some train ups knowing that we're going to be, uh, be replacing them very shortly. Um, and that was pretty much it. But I will tell you, I've heard a lot of discussion from different people about the length of time that we've been fighting these guys. And I will tell you personally, we were told at the very onset that we were the tip of the spear and to be prepared for a minimum of a 15-year fight at a bare minimum. That The National Command Authority really thought that it was going to take that long. Uh, and, and, you know, that's a pretty, uh, that, that's a pretty visionary statement to tell people, Hey, we're going to be fighting this thing for at least 15 years. Uh, and they were not incorrect. No, they were not. Uh, and, and unfortunately we're kind of still at this thing longer than we want to be, but different mm -hmm. discussion for you, a much different day. Um, Absolutely. so when do you actually get to go? Because are you thinking once again, that this whole thing is going to pass me by? Um, no. No, just uh, just following the events and, and uh, you know, kind of our daily briefings, um, we understood that what we were faced with was a much bigger adversary than just one or two people. Uh, and that if we were really going to uh, secure not only our nation, but kind of a global perspective of, of how to keep this, this kind of just non-human, you know, behavior, the behavior that's not compatible with peaceful coexistence anywhere, how we're going to keep that at bay. There's a lot of stuff that needs to be cleared out. You know, we kind of, we kind of got our first taste of that, um, back in Somalia, uh, back in, uh, the battle of Mogadishu, uh, mm -hmm. kind of see how some of that stuff ferries out. And as you start to now connect all the dots present day, well, 2001 present day 2001 2002 with kind of events that have transpired in the past you start to see where all this little this little cancer has taken root and kind of spread its spread its little tendrils throughout the world and well somebody's got to clean that mess up might as well be us do you remember your first sort of uh chance to get into operational medicine as it was called in a deployed environment um, yeah, pretty much right away. Uh, I get to, uh, first range battalion in July and literally we're doing a jump mission into, uh, I think it was into Florida, um, literally within three weeks of me being there. So, you know, again, because I had already done my time as an infantry officer and time in the Ranger regiment as an infantry officer, I really kind of knew how this joint readiness exercise played out. Um, it was not too much of a stretch for me just to pack my rucksack a little bit differently this time instead of packing, you know, extra batteries and a couple more rounds and, you know, extra ammunition. Now I'm packing extra medical supplies. Still jump out of the airplane the same way, only now I'm jumping out of a C-17 instead of a C-141. Well, I mean, I mean, sort of in a deployed environment when you actually get overseas, um, is it, and is it any different? Oh, um, no, it's exactly what I expected, to be honest with you. Um, you know, I, I'd, I'd had some limited inter interchange with my uh, colleague, great friend of mine, who's a third range battalion physician at the time, uh, telling me what they had seen on the ground. Um, I really knew going into it that the majority of stuff that I was going to be asked to do, or even if I wasn't asked my, my, the majority of my mission was to keep the guys healthy, uh, as we deployed. And, you know, that, that panned out over three different operational experiences. The most, most of my time was spent in advising the commander on keeping the guys healthy uh, and the right kind of a medical package to put with any assault package that, uh, that went out with and just doing continuous training whenever we had downtime, doing continuous training with the medics and the, uh, the infantry rangers on point of injury care. I probably spent maybe less than five to 10% of my total deployed time doing actual combat trauma medicine. Um, but everything, 
everything just lined up exactly the way as I had really anticipated it would. So as you're going through uh, your first deployment um, in Afghanistan, right after this whole thing kicks off, are, are you starting to feel like this is the pinnacle of, of what you wanted to do with the military? Um, it, you know, you kind of go through phases. Um, <laughs> after the, like the first couple of weeks of being there and, you know, not really having a lot of chance to do personal hygiene and uh, still trying to figure out the lay of the land and, and still really concerned about, you know, all the reports that we gotten from, you know, previous uh, uh, forces that were there, especially the Soviet occupation where there were so many buried landmines and everything. So anytime you would step off of your uh, operating base, you're like, oh my God, is the next step I'm going to take blow me up? You know, what, what do I do? So when you're starting in that initial phase, you're kind of like, I'm, I'm looking around thinking, did I really make the right decision? I mean, I just spent seven years in evil medical school and evil residency to do this. Um, this is kind of not that much different than being an infantry guy, except now I know how to actually put Band-Aids on people. Um, and, and that feeling rapidly went away. I thought, you know, this is exactly where I need to be. This is exactly the right thing to be doing. And this is this is pretty amazing opportunity. So you end up actually getting to Iraq as well. Were you there? Were you part of the initial invasion or shortly thereafter? Uh, yes, sir. So um, all three of the battalions. Second battalion was the main force deployed in uh, Afghanistan. Um, they cut, I think, one company loose uh, to augment uh, regimental headquarters, first and third battalions, into the initial pushes into Iraq. Uh, so we were all there fighting in the same sandbox at the same time. I also have uh, been informed that you were the primary medical examiner for the Jessica Lynch rescue. What was that experience like and kind of – can you give me the background details on that whole event? Um, I can give you some generalities, yes, sir. So uh, when, that whole, when that whole series of events transpired and that unit uh, essentially was uh, ambushed and, and – and, uh, Five or second maintenance company, so, right? I uh, believe so. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of their unit uh, members had, had been captured. Um, we were notified of the opportunity from the National Command Authority that they wanted to go in and repatriate. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, uh, I think Private Lynch was the only survivor uh, that was still in, uh, in captivity. And, you know, we did have an informant on the inside that was able to provide us with information. Uh, mm -hmm. We knew that she'd been pretty seriously injured, lots of orthopedic injuries. Um, and our concern was the discussion at the time, and again, this is through the intelligence that we had, was her leg was so badly injured that they were seriously, they being the uh, uh, Iraqi medical uh, folks, were seriously considering doing a, uh, an amputation in order to save, the re you know, to, to save her life. They just didn't have the resources that, that we could bring uh, uh, into, a, you know, into a battlefield space. And so the decision was made, we're going to go in and get her. I don't know about all the politics behind all the other stuff that you hear about that story. I, I can't tell you uh, that she was or was not attempted to be repatriated to us beforehand. That's not, you know, that's not for me to say. I can tell you that we planned that mission and executed that mission in about a 48-hour time frame. Um, I was the primary medical officer with the task force. Um, I asked my colleague who um, otherwise would not have uh, participated, I asked him to come along with us uh, specifically uh, to escort her, be her personal escort back from the uh, hospital compound that we repatriated her from uh, back to the crossload team that we had sitting in, a, in an aircraft on an, uh, on an airstrip a little bit further away because I wanted to stay specifically on the ground with my rangers uh, just in case something bad were to happen. We'll get to you going back in your career to sort of, you know, regular Army medicine, so to speak, and, and the training of it uh, with other people. But I, I guess I'm wondering, in your time doing this operational medicine with the rangers and in this, uh, you know, special operations community, so to speak, uh, mm -hmm. Do you look at it now as something that is uniquely different, um, or is it generally just the same? It's just sort of uh, there are some sort of things on the periphery that are different about it. Um, 
It's both of those, Mark, and it's, it's hard for me to give you a, a qualified yes-no answer. Uh, and the reason for that is in medicine, I will tell you this. Medicine is a world of, of relative truths and, and relative things. There's only about one absolute in medicine, and that's if you survive the birth process, eventually you're going to die. And everything else that happens in between is relative. So it's the same thing with doing operational medicine. Um, you can do, you know, kind of our mantra is, uh, you know, good medicine in bad places, but you always have to take into consideration what's going on around you in your environment in order to provide the optimal medical care that the environment, uh, permits. So how you do things in the middle of a combat operation and a, and a combat operation is not always necessarily just a, a big assault, but if you're on a main assault on an objective, there are there are medical principles that you can do on that objective, but it's best to defer, you know, real complex medicine to a time when, you know, stuff's not blowing up around you and burning around you and you've got to move uh, within a period of time. And, oh, yeah, by the way, the enemy does get a vote and they can come up and, you know, uh, put rounds on you at any time. So it's a it's a it's a learning experience. Um, and it's unfortunately, I don't think it's something that we do very well uh, with the organization being the Department of Defense in, in training those individuals who have not had the opportunity to serve in another capacity prior to going to uh, a medical school uh, situation. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more to operational medicine than just slinging Band-Aids, uh, you know, wearing night vision devices and, and cool guy stuff. By the way, I had never heard that phrase before. The only guarantee is if you survive the birth process, you're going to die. Uh, it's really <laughs> depressing. Uh, thank you. Um, I mean, it's put very well in context, but depressing as hell. I'm not going to lie. Uh, yeah. So uh, I guess it's what you do after the birth process that you may have some measure of control over. But again, uh, diff different discussion for a different day. Uh, so after you, you get out of the special ops community, um, it, you end up going back, I guess, to sort of be an instructor, correct? Um. Yeah, actually, the academic director. Um, and so go back and I'll have to take you back in time just a little bit. In our first go around in Afghanistan, um, we had uh, we had pulled up and set up an operational uh, base at both Kandahar Airfield and at Bagram. Um, and I was pretty much operating out of Kandahar. The 82nd Airborne had just come in to replace the 101st at the time, and the uh, Surgeon General for the Army had come in to visit with the 82nd guys and gals who had been there for all of about two or three weeks. And uh, I'd just come off of a mission. Um, I was just, I mean, literally getting my stuff off the helicopter, uh, throwing stuff in the uh, in the mule to take us back to the compound. And one of the guys came and said, hey, Doc, you're, you're needed over at the uh, 82nd area. I'm like, what the hell is going on? I said, look, uh, the Surgeon General's here, and uh, he wants to meet with all the physicians, and we were told to send you there as soon as you got back. I'm like, I don't work for the Surgeon General. I work for Commander SOCOM. I'm not going there. And no time to waste. He's like, no, sir, you, you really have to do these. These are some of those things that you're supposed to do as a field-grade officer, and, uh, yeah, you have to do this. This is not an option. I'm like, oh, man. So in true Ranger fashion, I grab my Ranger buddy, my senior medic. I'm like, come on, if I got to sit through this, you got to sit through this. So we go up and we listen to this uh, briefing from the 82nd folks telling uh, General Peak at the time, you know, all these things that were that they had done in the last two weeks that they'd been in country. And uh, I'm sitting there against the wall, kind of dirty and, and nasty body armor, just leaning up against the wall. And there's an SFPA sitting back in the corner, kicked back about the same way. And we're listening to the show. And when it was all over, he got up and explained how the Army was training its medics now and how they had expanded the program to take them through uh, 17 and a half weeks. And they would graduate as EMT basics, which in the civilian world means you're essentially authorized to drive an ambulance. And that's about it. You can take some vital signs, but you're not really doing high-speed pre-hospital medicine as an EMT basic. Somebody had sold him a bill of goods of what this really meant. And I kind of looked at my ranger buddy and I said, MTB. So, so we had a program in the ranger regiment at the time where I was taking infantry rangers, two infantry rangers from every squad, and we would put them through a six-week program of instruction uh, that was uh, nationally certified. To They came out of that as EMT intermediates at the time. They don't even have that anymore. But at the time, they were coming out in a six-week period of time with a higher level of training than these kids that were volunteering to come to the Army to be medics. 
And we were able to put them through some another week of like advanced trauma training uh, through some very high stress, highly realistic scenarios that most young medics will never have an opportunity to experience simply because of the resources that special operations puts into this kind of thing. Um, so I very stupidly raised my hands, sir, I'm, I'm not sure I understand this. So you're telling me that you're taking 17 and a half weeks and the best you can do is put out a group of people with EMTB certification. So, you know, we're doing, we're doing in half the time, we're getting a better trained combat medic. So I'm not sure where the disconnect is there, sir. It sounds like somebody's telling you the wrong stuff. And the next thing I know, my name gets put on a list somewhere. And as I'm coming out of Ranger Regiment, because I, I kind of tore up my elbow in Iraq and had to get rebuilt. So it was not, it would not be a good thing for me to stay at 1st Battalion uh, while I healed up. Um, I got a phone call and said, hey, we need you to come down and you're going to now take charge of the combat medic schoolhouse uh, at Fort Sam Houston. I'm like, hmm, okay, what's that mean? Uh, and they said, well, essentially, you're going to be in charge of the academic program. So this is late 2003 um, when I'm asked to come down to Fort Sam Houston. And I find a program that's 17 and a half weeks long. And, you know, again, these are guys and gals that are volunteering to be medics, volunteering to be combat medics. Um, at the time, I think they called them healthcare specialists. Seventy percent of every one of our graduating classes at that time was going directly into combat, either meeting their unit that was already deployed or going to a unit who'd already done all their train up at the Joint Readiness Training Center or National Training Center and already had their equipment going forward. And they were just going to go essentially get you know, get issued their, um, uh, their equipment, their weapon and head out with their unit with absolutely no additional train up. And what I found was a course that in 17 and a half weeks was highly, highly, um, I guess, emphasizing clinical skills. How do you do EKGs on the ward? They had, and they had even converted an entire floor of a barracks into a simulated hospital ward uh, with simulated the little robot patients in there. It's very high fidelity, very great stuff. Just not what the Army needed at all. They needed to produce combat medics and uh, medics that understood the basics of tactical combat casualty care and, and how to take care of people and how to train their non-medical people, how to be their assistants. So we completely revised the course. Um, and uh, I was fortunate enough to be able to do that in the uh, in over about a two-year period of time and then turned that program over to another colleague of mine who kept it going forward. And I, I think that we got that process going. It was a hell of a lot slower than I would have liked to have uh, seen it happen just because, you know, I'm a ranger. I, I, you know, I, see a, I see a problem. I attack the problem, solve the problem, move on to the next one. Um, but that ranger mentality doesn't really fit well in the Army Medical Department. So <laughs> I was Makes not sense. a great, yeah. I was not a great success in the Ranger, you know, mentality of this is how we're going to do things. Uh, probably had to adopt a more SF oriented approach of, Hey, let me co-opt you into seeing how we can do things better. <laughs> I probably would have had more success at that. <laughs> I have been fortunate enough to learn that much about the special ops community as being somebody who was fortunate enough to be in it, that it's a different world there. Uh, and the conventional army, the regular army doesn't always march to the beat of the same drum. Um, and, and that's, that's fine. It's okay. That doesn't make one better than the other. Uh, the army, as you know, is a very diverse force and it, and it does many different things. And the idea is that we sort of have a, a tool for, for every problem in our toolbox and, and that's, it, it, things are just different and that's okay. And I think that, that when you try to merge some of the two of them, you get some friction at times. I, I think that's completely fair and understandable. Yep, you're exactly correct, Mark. And, the, you know, the only thing that I would amplify onto that is when you're looking at the Army Medical Department, now you're dealing with something that's completely separate and distinct. Um, very frustrating at the time in the initial phases of this war that we had such a disconnect uh, between our strategic leadership on the medical side of the house and what was really needed from them to actually support the war fighters. And again, they've got a big mission, right? They've got to take care of not only the hospitals and the clinics and the, uh, and the medical people that are on active duty, but they've got to do that for the reserve component, for the National Guard. They've got to do retiree care. They've got to oversee this TRICARE thing. 
it's a huge thing. It's just unfortunate that really what we should be about is focused on our combat mission. And it took a long time to get the Army Medical Department to understand, you know what, you're absolutely right. Um, in fact, we didn't have a we didn't even have a consultant to the Surgeon General for combat medicine until about two years ago. You know, up until that time, if you if you wanted to know something about you know how many kids do we have who are dependents that have diabetes, you could ask your pediatric endocrinologist consultant to the Surgeon General. And we had lots of consultants to the Surgeon General, not one consultant for combat medicine or battlefield medicine. Crazy. Uh, so it is. I, I mean, it's. I don't want to ask you which is more rewarding, but I, I mean, you know, the idea that you can shape the force in the future, um, mm -hmm. sometimes maybe as important, if not more important than the work you do on the ground at any given time. Um, so is it fair to compare the two? Uh, yes, sir. I believe I understand what you're asking. And I would tell you that Different people will give you different answers, right? For me, I, I found great satisfaction in being the guy on the ground. Um, but I had a very wizened uh, young ranger NCO give me the God's honest truth. And here's the God's honest truth to being an officer in the United States Army. You and I, well, when I was on active duty, we are temporary summer help, Mark. Mm -hmm. That's what we are. And the NCOs are the ones that run this show. And so mm -hmm. while I had probably more medical knowledge just from virtue of having gone through the medical school and uh, uh, residency program, when it all boils down to it, the skills that you need on the ground are, are very, very few and can be executed by anyone that you can train up. Um, there's a mindset that goes behind that and how to employ those skills, but your true life-saving skills are very few. And so I would be very arrogant to tell you that, you know, oh, my God, nobody could do the job. I'm going to tell you this. The honest reality is any well-trained ranger medic, special forces medic could do my job as far as slinging bandages and doing casualty care and casualty evacuation. They probably shoot better than I do, too, uh, on an objective. Um, there's many people that can do that. Um, they're, they might not have that resident thought process to look at the longevity of force health protection and logistics and all that kind of stuff. But actually being on the ground, anybody can do that. But I think the bigger contribution to the organization is for those of us that have been able to or been fortunate enough to be in a position to make long-standing changes. Um, I'll give you some four examples. Uh, for example, now probably on your kit, you have an IFAC, correct? Mm-hmm. Well, when we deployed into both Afghanistan and Iraq in the initial phases, the conventional Army's first aid kit was still a compass pouch with an outdated uh, dressing. And if you were really high speed, you had a couple of those outdated dressings crammed down in that compass pouch. I don't know if you remember those days. I do. Um, we went back uh, while I was down at the combat medic school house, we went back and we were uh, very heated after action reviews. That was one of the things that we identified early on is, you know, you don't have a capability of doing adequate combat casualty care at the point of injury. So we need to not only equip our force, we need to train our force and we need to do it simultaneously. Because if you just throw a bunch of equipment out there, which is what the Marines did in their initial push into Afghanistan, I got to meet with some of these kids and they'd been issued a brand new uh, first aid kit, but they weren't allowed to break into it unless somebody really got hurt. Um, and they got it right as they were going out the door. So none of them really knew how to use the stuff, but they knew they had it and that gave them some reassurance. Um, some of the guys from some of the conventional army units had heard about this tactical combat casualty care thing that was new at the time, revolutionary. And they knew that they needed equipment. They'd had some training on it, but they didn't have the equipment. So if you don't have equipment, Without, or if you have equipment but don't have the training or have the training without the equipment, you don't have a capability. Uh, and that's what we were all about in getting the IFAC out to the force. So now that you have a capability at the individual soldier level that's geared towards survivability. Same thing with that warrior aid and lead litter kit that's on, a, on our vehicles now. You know, what good does it do to have a, a, essentially a plastic pencil box with a couple of Band-Aids and Bacitracin that might help you if you skin your knuckles in the motor pool, but if your vehicle gets hit with an IED, those Band-Aids and Bacitracin aren't going to help you very much. 
you know? Right. Uh, and so as we do those kinds of things, I think that's what makes a, a lasting um, positive uh, effect on the force going forward. So all the people now, I'm, I'm out of the military for, you know, 12 years now, but all of those things that we implemented are, are still in play and still saving lives and are still being updated and, and uh, improved as technology improves. You mentioned being out of the military, uh, and I wonder, just you're a regular old ER doc now, no more operational medicine for you. Uh, is there still as much <laughs> as fulfillment and enjoyment because you, you had worked so hard to be in operational medicine? I mean, when you have to go back to sort of normal triage, if you will, is it the same? I think that's the conundrum that everybody in the military faces. Uh, you know, when you leave, the, eventually you're going to leave the military. Right. You're going to take the green uniform off and you're going to transition back into a civilian world that you may or may not feel like you fit in with or you feel like you can operate effectively in. But any good operator knows you, you have to understand your environment in order to operate effectively in it. And, you know, there are times that, you know, there are times that I miss the excitement of it. I will tell you, I miss more the camaraderie that came with, you know, being in harm's way with a group of like-minded individuals. That's the one thing that I miss. Um, do I miss being actually hazarding myself or, or taking care of people that had hazarded themselves? I don't miss that. I, honestly, I don't need to take care of another shot up, blown up kid. Uh, I've got enough of those t-shirts. Um, but I, I miss the... Uh, the the camaraderie of of working with that caliber of a person. I just haven't I haven't found that same equivalent in the uh, in the civilian world. And I'll do things to help kind of parlay my experience and I think my expertise uh, to try to help our civilian colleagues. Um, I spent the first probably five to ten years out, out of uniform um, working towards teaching our first responders. Um, maybe not better, but different techniques of intervening and saving lives uh, at the point of injury, taking all of those lessons that we've learned uh, through the military medicine and applying them appropriately to the appropriate and uh, hostile environment uh, in, on the civilian side. You ever come into contact where you did something and one of your other colleagues on the civilian side looked at you and said, where the hell did you learn that? Where'd you get that from? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, the first time I slung a, a cat tourniquet in the emergency department, um, and I, so I would carry stuff in, in my emergency department uniform, uh, which is essentially, uh, khakis with cargo pockets. I, I don't, I, I don't find scrubs to be anything, but just kind of a, you know, pajamas. So if I'm going to be doing things, I like to be prepared and I like to have stuff in my cargo pockets. And so in one cargo pocket, I carry a couple of cat tourniquets and the other cargo pocket, I carried uh, one or two rolls of combat gauze. And uh, one of the first really bad things that we saw, people kind of look at me and slap a tourniquet on a guy's arm, start packing a wound with, uh, with combat gauze. I'm like, well, what in God's name are you doing? It's like, yeah. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Well, I'm not from the government, but uh, <laughs> learn this in the military. I'll take you through it here after a while. And, you know, when started showing them what we had learned uh, and, and how to utilize these things, people were like, yeah, this makes a lot of sense. So getting some of that equipment where it makes sense to put that equipment in the civilian world, yeah, it's kind of rewarding. My favorite part of that story is that it came from cargo pockets. I think they're underrated. In cargo shorts, they're still underrated. <laughs> they sort of made their way out from a fashion standpoint, but I still wear them because I love cargo shorts and I love those pockets, damn it. Absolutely. So <laughs> I'll give it a thumbs up for cargo pockets and cargo shorts. All right. Uh, so, you know, you're going through this, uh, you're 12 years removed from the military. Uh, what sort of still tugs at your heartstrings about the Army and Army medicine, that matter? Oh, God. Um, it, it's always the people, you know. It's, it's always about the people, um, you know, uh, and again, with an all volunteer force, we've got, uh, America's, uh, you know, sons and daughters. That's our treasure. Uh, expensive airplanes, expensive helicopters, you know, inexpensive bullets. But when you buy a lot of them, they become expensive. All that material stuff, that's all wealth and treasure that can always be replaced. No, absolutely. And again, I think that, uh, when you talk about our force and, and who we are, obviously it's made up of our people, and that is something that, that uh, is what separates us as a military from other militaries across the world. Really, it is. I mean, it, it, it's it's the people who put the uniform on that choose to make this this military so good at what we do um, and, and their desire to be good at what they do. So 
Uh, it all comes together in that aspect. Uh, what do you have planned for the future for yourself? You're just going to keep plugging away at civilian medicine going forward? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I still haven't figured out what I want to be when I grow up. Yeah, me so, uh, <laughs> for the time being, I'm, I'm still doing um, emergency medicine, uh, no longer in you know, a, a major trauma center. Like I said, I've got enough of those t-shirts. Uh, I found that I actually like, uh, having, having the opportunity and the time to sit and actually talk with my patients, not just ask them questions about why they're there, do a quick, you know, do a quick exam, order a bunch of stuff and then, you know, take off. And I, I might get to see you for another two minutes before I send you either home or upstairs to the hospital. Uh, you know, where I'm working now, um, which is essentially what we call a freestanding emergency center. Um, so we've taken an emergency department and just detached it from a hospital and put it in the middle of a, a of a community somewhere. Um, so now instead of having, you know, everybody that has to drive to a hospital to get care, now you don't have to just drive the hospital. I mean, you can come to one of our facilities. We can take care of you. Um, it's it's a great construct. Met a lot of great Americans. And it's amazing what you can learn when you have time to actually sit and talk with them. Yeah. I mean, uh, amazing describes what has been 24 plus years of, of your career in the military and somebody who really, uh, you know, helped reshape army medicine. Um, you know, again, you talk about the medic training program and what you end up doing. And that, that is something that maybe, as I said earlier, more important than the work you did on the ground, the lives you may have saved there in the, in, in the big picture, you know, the 30,000 foot view, but, um, by, Every estimation, a very unique journey for you, Jeff. Um, it really was something that you know you don't see often as people go uh, to West Point and, and then want to be an infantry ranger guy and somehow end up you know uh, putting on tourniquets and bandaging people up and saving lives. So from that standpoint, just a, an, an incredible journey for you. Yes, sir. And I'll tell you, it's you know, it's never about an individual. Um, I certainly didn't do anything in this world by myself. Uh, it was always it was always with a team. Uh, and, and for a team. And uh, I've just been God, so fortunate uh, to serve with the people that I've served with. Just amazing ride. Absolutely. So I want to leave you with a thought on post-traumatic stress and what we colloquially know as a post-traumatic stress disorder. Um, and I will tell you this. I think that we should be looking at this whole concept as not a disorder. A disorder implies that there is something that is inherently not normal about your thought process. And usually it's either something that you were born with or something that has developed through your period of time that's something that you're going to have to live with forever. And we may be able to medicate a disorder, but you know, a disorder is a disorder and, and you just have that and you just live with it. I think what a better term for what we're seeing with post-traumatic stress and that type of a thing would be better termed as an injury because it doesn't happen until you've had an exposure to a very stressful event. And if we look at things in terms of injuries, injuries can be rehabbed, right? I can maybe not get you back to the same state that you were before, but there's a hope and a promise that if we do this in a dedicated fashion, we can get you past an injury and back to being very highly functional and hopefully without the need for a whole bunch of different medications. And there are some great people out there doing some great things that all have a part of the solution. Um, I'll tell you, I can't say enough good about my colleague who uh, is really pushing the uh, uh, cervical ganglion block. That is such a tremendous tool to help reset your uh, kind of system and how it's how it's amped up with one of these stressful events to reset it to allow other things to help guide that healing process. Well, that's just um, incredible words, man. But, you know, a, a disorder kind of connotates something negative, right? And, sure, and, yeah. And, and, and we're, you know, ah, the disorder is that, that's that crazy person that's just, you know, they're just bubbling under the surface, ready to explode. And, and that's not what our folks are faced with. You know, we don't call, a, we call it a traumatic brain injury when we're exposed to blast or yeah. you've had a concussive type thing. You know, we don't tell amputees that they have disorders of their limbs. 
these are folks that have injuries and, and, and with a good medical team. I think that as we look at more and more uh, technology and, and, and put more emphasis on uh, studying this phenomenon, we're going to find a, a, a technique to rehab people effectively through these injuries. Perfectly said. Uh, just a, a different viewpoint that I think everybody needed to hear. So certainly thank you for that. Absolutely. Thank you for your time and certainly everything that you've been able to share with us. Wish you nothing but continued success. And certainly thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Yes, sir. You too. Thank you, Mark. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.